Greetings from the Anna I. Young Alumni House on Agnes Scott's campus. I'm Toby Emmert, Associate Professor and Director of Teacher Education, and I'll be your host for your Scotty Book Month discussion. Alumni across the country are joining our first year students by reading Outcast United, An American Town, A Refugee Team, and One Woman's Quest to Make a Difference by Warren St. John. The story of a refugee youth soccer team in Clarkston, Georgia, just five miles from the campus of Agnes Scott College. I recently had the opportunity to talk with Luma Mufflay about the work she does with the Fuji soccer team and about the partnership that we have developed at Agnes Scott with the Fujis. Today I'm talking with Luma Mufflay, who is the founder of the Fuji's family organization. And I have a few questions for her that I wanted to ask and share with you. So Luma, I know people are always interested in the story of how you got involved in this organization, how the idea came to you, where the vision arrived from. Can you tell us that story? It was, it was by accident. A lot of people assume like you know, I had this big vision and I went into the community and created this you know, soccer program and tutoring program in school, but it wasn't like that. Um, I had been driving to Clarkson, which is about five miles, five, six miles from Agnes Scott, um, on my way to a Middle Eastern grocery store to get food um, that reminded me of home. I'm originally from Jordan, so there's not a lot of places where you can get uh, authentic hummus and pita bread. And on my way back, I missed the turn uh, that I was supposed to go into, so I kept driving and then you turned into one of the apartment complexes further down the street. And when I did that, in the parking lot, there were a group of boys playing soccer. And they were playing barefoot and, um, you know, had little rocks set up for goals, and it reminded me of home. Um, and so I sat in my car watching them for a while, and th it was some kind of magical moment to, to see that happen. And later on in the week, I came back out, um, but this time I was armed with a soccer ball. I came out of my car, and the boys immediately came running to it because it was a significantly nicer than their ball. And then um, I asked if I could play in return. They were a little hesitant to have a stranger, let alone a woman, come in and join their game. So they got into their little huddle, uh, discussed it, and then came back out and said, okay, but you're on their team. And I got the team with a chubby kid and a really small one, but that was okay. And we were out there playing for a couple of hours, and it was wonderful. It was uh, as pure as the game gets. You know, It wasn't as competitive or um, no parents were yelling on the sidelines. It was just for the fun of the game. And so I kept making excuses to leave work um, and come out and play with the boys. And then I asked them if they wanted to form a team. They thought they were going to go pro. Um, <laughs> but we ended up you know, forming our first team and holding tryouts. We flyered the neighborhoods, um, and the boys went out recruiting uh, kids and their friends. And when we'd drive in the streets, if we found kids that were about the right height, we'd stop. We're like, come on, you want to join the Fuji? Not the Fujis at the time, but do you want to join our team? Um, and it just grew from there. And how did you come up with the name Fuji's family? Um, I, I don't know, like I don't remember that exact moment. I remember um, we were trying to figure out names and you know, it was all the usual suspects came out, you know, All Stars, Arsenal, Liver they started naming their professional team and I was like, well, what about the Fuji's, you know, because you guys are all refugees. And I think part of it was I had the hip hop band in the back of my head um, so we're called the, the Fujis was our soccer name. Um, but I remember one night after the first season, I was dropping one of the kids off home. And um, this was before I was getting ready to go away for a couple of weeks. I usually go away for a week or so right after um, the end of the season to get some sleep. Um, and I was dropping the boy off, and he was really quiet. And then I look over, and he's crying. And um, I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, you told us not to call you. And I had, I had told them, like, I need a week off. You are not to call me at all. If you call me, I'm going to kick you off the team. I just need a break for a while. Um, and I'm like, I'm just going away for a week. I'll be back. He's like, no, you're never coming back. What's going to happen to the Fuji's family when you leave? Mm -hmm. And I was a little shocked by his uh, reaction, but then it made sense. Like, this is a boy that had been abandoned for most of his life, had no stability, had no security, didn't have figures that stayed constant. Um, so it made sense, and I was like, so what do I do now? I was like, I'm going on vacation. I'm definitely not taking him with me. And so I gave him my watch. I don't go anywhere without my watch. I was like, well, here's my watch. You just um, keep it, and when I get back, I'm going to come back and collect it. And so don't worry, I'll be back. Um, little did I know that he didn't know how to tell time. It wasn't a digital watch, and so he called every day. You know, he's like, coach, what time is it? I'm like, 
it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> so that was his excuse to call every day. It's a great story. So I know you went to a women's college, <laughs> I, Smith, right? I did. Mm -hmm. Do you think that there are things that happened for you as a result of going to women's college that have led you to this moment in your life? Uh, yes. Um, I think uh, being at a women's college is is very powerful. It shapes you, uh, the kind of friendships you form, you will not form anywhere else but at a women's college. Um, and the confidence that it gives you that you are able to succeed anywhere in the world. Like I know I may be quoting some Smith or Agnes Scott brochure at this point, but it's true. Uh, I had a lot of friends in high school go to co-ed schools and they didn't form the friendships and camaraderie and the networks that I, I was able to form going to a women's college. And I remember at Smith, we were allowed to take classes at the five colleges, and so I took a couple of classes at Amherst, and the professors could always tell who went to Smith because they were the women that spoke up in class. Mm -hmm. Amherst women didn't speak up, um, the UMass, or even the Mount Holyoke women didn't, but the Smith women were mm -hmm. a little bit more, um, a little less shy, I guess. Um, and then working with the refugee population, I think it's important because I was in a environment where it was minority education and the refugees are definitely a minority and so being able to make those correlations and those connections there's a lot of parallels and similarities. How did you first get involved with Agnes Scott? I don't really remember the exact moment. I had a coffee shop across the tracks um, that had a lot of students that would come over. I employed like four or five Agnes Scott students. Um, after the New York Times article ran, Agnes Scott reached out to us to lend us their field. So I remember the rest of that season we played our home games here, which was really nice because uh, it's a beautiful soccer field. And then slowly I think we got started getting volunteers out, uh, people started reaching out, and then one of our volunteers introduced us to you. Um, and then you know we formed a relationship. Uh, that was because well, I've been involved with the organization and the work you're doing with the summer camp for two years. Mm -hmm. So w when was that? When did you first start practicing here? Uh, three years ago, two, okay. two and a half, three years ago. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, Elizabeth Keish has always been a big supporter. She reached out to us right after the New York Times article. I think she was instrumental in letting us use the field. Um, so. so I know that there are big plans for the future. Okay. So you and I have had some conversations yeah. about that. Um, but I only have a small inkling of what they are, so can you tell me more? I don't want to scare people off, that's why I just <laughs> give them the small inkling. Um, we just purchased land, we purchased 18.6 uh, acres of land in Clarkson where we are going to build our home. We're going to build a school uh, for refugee kids, uh, grades 6 through 12, um, with a soccer field that we will finally be able to call our home. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be the first uh, school in the country, uh, probably in the world. Uh, of its kind to be a privately funded uh, school that focuses on refugee education. Um, so that's that's one of the plans. Um, like the other night at the fundraiser. Yes, yes, <laughs> you said something about the girls, which was the first time I'd ever heard you say that. Mm -hmm. So that's something in the plans. Yeah, that... it's um, you know, so when we build our facility, our first grade of sixth graders will come in. So we'll have a classroom for boys, a class, they're not going right, to be together. Right, right. There's no way we're going to cross that. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's fair to provide this incredible education only for boys, especially going to Smith and growing up in the Middle East. But I think we'll overcome the obstacles we faced with some of the parents in the community um, is that we will have one safe space for the girls. Mm -hmm. The parents will always know where they are. You know, we're not walking from one field to the other to, you know, it's right here. Okay. Thanks for talking to me, Luna. You're welcome. Before we talk more about the book, you should know that your alma mater is thriving. This year we have a record enrollment and our campus is wonderfully diverse with students from all over the world. They are smart, compassionate leaders with the minds and hearts to really make a difference. The Education Department has developed several new initiatives over the last couple of years. In the spring of 2008, we initiated the Educational Studies Minor. And in the summer of 2009, for the first time, we hosted the Fuji's Summer Academic Boot Camp as a result of the volunteer work that one of our graduates, Mary Helen Ramming, did with the Fuji's in the summer of 2008. We fortunately were able to host the Fuji's again in the summer of 2010. We also have developed specific partnerships with the International Community School, which is an elementary school located about four miles from our campus that has students who are both refugee, immigrant, and American-born. 
and we have developed a partnership with the Global Village School, which is a private school for refugee teenage girls housed at the Decatur Presbyterian Church. We also have recently begun to develop a partnership with the Atlanta International School. There are a lot of interesting things going on in the Education Department. Members of the class of 2014, our first year students, were asked to submit a written or a creative response to their reading of Outcast United. The following discussion questions for your group are based on the same themes the students used for their work. Soon after she meets these refugee boys, Luma Maflay is inspired to become their coach. Why? What does she gain from volunteering like this? How does her experience connect to service projects in which you have been involved? Outcast United presents a vivid depiction of the rapid changes Clarkston, Georgia has undergone in the last 30 years. How has your own community experience change, whether based on expansion, contraction, or shifts in population? What specific examples demonstrate these changes? In part three of Outcast United, Warren St. John describes the difficult labor conditions experienced by many refugees and the difficult work schedule for Jenna Rose and Tuari. Like many of the parents depicted in the book, Jenna Rose sacrifices much for her children. In what ways does the notion of sacrifice play a part in your life? How have the sacrifices of those around you helped you get where you are today? What personal sacrifices have you made or would you be willing to make for family members? Thank you for participating in Scotty Book Month. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. I think it's exciting to think about alumni across the country reading and discussing the same book we are studying on campus. I would also like to thank the host for today's event. We really appreciate you opening your home for this special event. If you would like more information on the Fujis, they can be found online at www.fujisfamily.org. We hope to see you on campus soon. Greetings from your alumni office. I'm Kim Vickers, class of 1987, Director of Alumni Relations here at Agnes Scott. I would like to thank all of you for participating in this year's Scotty Book Month and a special thank you to our alumna hosting the event. I hope that you've enjoyed the book, Outcast United, but even more so, I hope you've enjoyed connecting back to the college and today's students. If you would like to continue that connection, I encourage you to sign up for our online career network. It's a wonderful opportunity for you to be able to share your career knowledge and contacts with Agnes Scott students. If you are interested, your hostess has cards on hand that show you how to get started. It only takes a small amount of time to sign up and it'll be a big help to our students. Thank you.